Travis Bader, and this is the Silvercore Podcast. Silvercore has been providing its members with the skills and knowledge necessary to be confident and proficient in the outdoors for over 20 years, and we make it easier for people to deepen their connection to the natural world. If you enjoy the positive and educational content we provide, please let others know by sharing, commenting, and following so that you can join in on everything that Silvercore stands for. If you'd like to learn more about becoming a member of the Silvercore Club and community, visit our website at silvercore.ca. Today I'm joined by the renowned conservationist, host of the massively popular Wired to Hunt podcast, author, angler, hunter, and resident whitetail guy at Meat Eater. Welcome to the Silvercore podcast, Mark Kenyon. Hey, thank you, Travis. I appreciate it. Glad to be here. Absolutely. Well, took me a little bit to get through that intro there, but we got there. Um, yes. So you've got a reputation, a reputation of being a hardworking whitetail hunter, but you also have a reputation which precedes you Uh-oh. that uh, uh, you might be aware of or you might not be. I was having, sitting by the campfire, waiting for the lamb to roast up. We're having dinner with a friend of mine who has worked with you in the past and unsolicited, Mm -hmm. she brings up you and she says that you are genuine and that you're kind, that you're modest and you're professional. And those are the four things that really stuck out in my mind, completely unsolicited. And I thought, this is really cool. Coming from an industry where, you know, I've, I've done chats before with people and they talk about ego in the industry, particularly when it comes to social media and trying to, I guess, you have to promote yourself and promote a business. Yeah. For you to be able to navigate that terrain and still go through with a reputation of being modest and kind and genuine, that was what really intrigued me, what made <laughs> me want to chat with you. Um, I don't know if you've heard that before. Chances are you probably have. Well, I, I really, I really appreciate that, and uh, and hearing that kind of feedback is is maybe the best thing I could ask for as far as um, a reputation preceding me, because those <laughs> things are really important to me. Those are things that uh, that matter to me, and I'm I'm glad that that's, um, you know, how people are perceiving, um, what I bring to the world. I guess um, it is a pet peeve of mine seeing. So, so much of that ego and bravado and um yeah there is a lot of that in the world in general and within in our general. community i think in our community there's definitely a lot of opportunities for that and um and so i i try to avoid that kind of stuff and just um oh, heck i don't know it's hard talking just, about yourself isn't it yeah yeah <laughs> it always is but um but yeah I, that was really kind of her to say that and um I'm going to try to keep on living up to that reputation and, and that's maybe the best thing I could do. Well, when you look at a person like uh, who's really in the public eye, so Bear Grylls, I've read a few of his books and he talks about there's Bear and there's BG. There's the internet persona or the TV persona, the action hero BG, which is built up by others, not necessarily himself. And then there's Bear, the person at home with his family doing his thing. And I get the sense that you probably run into a similar thing where others will will portray you in a certain way, but the difference between the MK and the Mark are probably a little bit more level. Like what you see on TV, what you see in social media is probably pretty akin to how you are. Yeah, you're, you're spot on. That actually is, um, I think m- maybe that's different for me compared to a lot of folks within the, you know, the, the public media space. But I, I think what has maybe what has separated me in some regards from others within the outdoor media space is that, um, I don't have some superhero persona that I can put on. I don't have a Superman cape I can throw on and impress people. I'm not, um, you know, there's, I've seen a couple different ways to establish a voice and credibility within the world of, you know, outdoor media or probably any kind of media, but there's, sure. there's like the expert, there's like the expert guy mm-hmm. or girl who's like amazing at everything. They're good at everything. They know everything. Um, and they wow you with how great they are. Mm. Um, and 
when I came into this, I came into this with no, you know, leg to stand on within that world. Because 15 years ago, when I started doing this kind of stuff, I was just a kid who was in love with this lifestyle. I loved it. I lived it. Mm. It was everything I thought about, but I wasn't an expert. I was just someone with a, with, with passion oozing from, from every single crack and seam. And so what I brought to the table 15 years ago and what I've realized is all I really can bring to the table is the very real story of my experiences chasing these passions and my unending curiosity to learn more. Um, so yeah, like what you see on TV is 100% the same person that my wife sees, you know, in the evening, um, because I'm, I'm not, I, I, I can't impress anyone. I'm just who I am. <laughs> I'm just a goofy, lanky guy. Who's a nerd who has a lot of books behind me, who loves to read, who loves to learn, who's, who, who loves the outdoors and who would do anything he could do to, to, to keep them around for future generations and for my kids. And I'm a goober and I, you know, <laughs> uh, that's just, that's, that's all I can do. I, I, I've tried at times in my career or I felt pressure to try to, you know, I felt like I had to be like this person or that person. Mm. I'd see someone who was a role model of mine or I'd see somebody who's doing well in, in this thing or that thing. And I think, oh, I, I need to be more like that if I want to succeed or achieve my goals. And every time I've tried to do that, I've fallen on my face. Mm. That, does, that doesn't resonate with people because I can't be something I'm not. The only thing I've found that has led to success for me is just leaning into being as authentically me as I possibly can. That's not going to appeal to everyone. Not everyone's going to like what I bring to the table. Not everyone's going to appreciate my message or my mustache or my hats or my <laughs> whatever it is. Sure. Uh, but that's all I can be. All I can be at the very best is, is who I am really, really, truly. And so I've, I finally gotten to a place where I'm comfortable with that. Mm. And, um, and I think for those people that I resonate with, that's the best way that I can be of service to them. Well, you're building your audience of people who who want to see the genuine you. How difficult would it be to live a life where you are putting on that different persona where you're out in one place and you come home? You know, it, it brings to mind a local telecommunications company that we have over here called TELUS, and before it was BC Tel. And there was a point in time where if you got a phone bill and – let's say you drop calls or pager or whatever it was, dating myself a little bit, uh, and you wanted to negotiate your bill down with the company, you had to get mad at them. And you had to uh, uh, get a supervisor on the line and go through this whole process. And they, I remember, I didn't like doing that. I didn't want to have to go. And I would ask them, like, do I have to get mad in order to get this down? I mean, they'd go through this whole thing, and then they'd escalate it. And they had this whole procedure yeah. in place. And at one point... They made a switch because they realized that they were training their audience to basically or training their customer base to get mad at them. Like if you want to have – that was the interaction that they were having. And so all of a sudden they said, you know, you can get as mad as you want. We're not doing anything. However, if you're kind and respectful and we go through this process, we'll bend over backwards to help you. And I thought that was from a business perspective very interesting that you train your customer but also from a just – sustainability and growth standpoint for somebody like yourself in this sphere, I see you as a leader in the industry and you are essentially training the people who follow you as to uh, how you would like to be treated if, let's say, you ran into them when you're out hunting by your example. And you do a lot of that through example. You're not out there preaching, but there's a lot of example-driven are you actively thinking of it sort of as in this telecommunication case, or is this just something that you, you're doing? I think um, it's not necessarily something I'm actively thinking about all the time, but it is. Um, I feel like as my platform has grown and I reach more people with what I say and what I do, um, I do have a recognition of, uh, of like the responsibility I have because I, I am leading by example, whether mm. in a good way or a bad way. And um, I have realized that's, that's a responsibility and an opportunity, right? Mm. So it's a responsibility that, that falls on my shoulders whether I want it or not because a lot of people see and hear what I do, so that's inherent. But then also uh, you can look at it as an opportunity, and I do, because almost the only reason I do what I do now, um, which is, you know, write about – 
talk about and produce films and videos about hunting and fishing and how we can, you know, continue doing those things in a positive way and promote the future of these things and protect the future of the things. That's what I do. And Mm. I do that because a, I love it. It's the only life I could live, but then B all of my energy now is, is more and more geared towards giving back to this thing, protecting this thing, conserving this thing. Um, that's that's where my energy is really focused hopefully for now in the next 35 40 years however much longer i have on this earth um and so i look at this as an opportunity because there are a lot of things that i um can see within the world where uh, we need to make progress we need to Mm -hmm. as a community or um yeah as a community like we need to be working towards things or we need to be acting in certain ways or we need to be speaking about and representing ourselves in in certain ways or we need to fight this fight um support this cause, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned like, I could go about this, I could try to, you know, work towards those goals by preaching about it all the time. And, you know, talking about these things is important, but Mm -hmm. I don't think anything, right. You know, it's the old cliche actions speak louder than words. There's nothing that speaks and nothing that can um, promote something or showcase something, nothing more than you actually doing it um, is as powerful as that. So I do look at the fact that, hey, I have a platform. There are some people who pay attention to what I'm doing, and I better walk the walk if I plan mm-hmm. to ever talk the talk. So, so yes, I, I think about this stuff not all the time, but I do reflect on it and, and, and will you know, try to take the opportunity to think through, okay, what are the things that are important to me and important to the future of these things I care about so much? Um, are you living that way just as much as you're saying you do? How do you find that balance though? I mean, if you come in to something that you are so passionate about and you just, you love what you do, you love being outdoors, you love the connection with nature, you love the hunting. And you know, it's like that old adage of, let's say somebody who's really good at their job. They're the top person at the local business. That's uh, let's say the top janitor and they promote that person to a level where now they're the manager of all the other janitors. And they're like, you know, I, I've been growing in this space, but I don't enjoy managing. I enjoyed what I was doing before. Do you find that there's a difficult balance as you grow to continue to do what it is that you're passionate about or are your passions evolving? You know, it's a good question. And it's one that, um, you know, I was actually talking to someone recently. They, they had asked, you know, if I, if I harbored interest in, you know, getting more into, the business side of things or the managerial side of things or the leadership side of things. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and what I said and and how I feel is that I want to continue to have leadership, but I want to lead with the tools that I have passions and skills around. And that's not necessarily in business or in manager managing. Um, it's communication, storytelling, Mm. speaking, writing like that. That's, where I have some level of skill and that really nicely matches up with my passion because, you know, if you want to speak and tell stories or communicate, having lived experiences about those things sure as heck helps. And so I'm able to continue, you know, doing the things I love outside hunting and fishing and camping and backpacking and all those things because it gives me a foundation to then speak and write and film and, and tell important stories. So, um, I, I will say like, I don't want to do anything else in my life. Like I don't, there isn't a next step. There isn't a next job. Um, you know, uh, the, the basic job description of being a storyteller and a writer and, a, a, a speaker about these things, um, a storyteller about these things. That's what I want to do. I just want to continue doing it and speaking to more people and, and hopefully having a, a larger impact. Um, they say leadership's the art of influencing human behavior as to accomplish a mission in the manner so desired by the leader. And, you know, if you're, you clearly seem to be driven by something more than just hunting and fishing, than just being outside. And I'm from an outsider looking in, family seems to play a very massive role with you. That seems evident just from somebody looking in. Um, staying grounded seems to be something that you actively work on in order to, um, as you move through your career and your social media presence, uh, what would you say 
is your guiding principle that's kind of pushing you forward that allows you to be outside to do what you love to do, but is your, uh, your North star, I guess. Yeah. Um, so, uh, there's, there's, there's two parallel, I guess, lines, I would think there's this, this line of, of purpose, I think is a big thing. And mm. just having like a purpose, focused life, I think is something that has helped me stay true to, to things. And then there's like foundational principles or, or virtues maybe that then mm. guide how I do that. I think. So I, I have, I have, I'm very purpose. I'm very goal oriented, purpose focused. So I need to have a thing that I'm chasing or a thing that matters a lot to me that I can keep my eye on. Mm. Um, and so those things would basically involve at this point, you know, one is working towards a better future for wildlife and wild places. Like that's, that's top of the career focus. That's top of, um, anything along those lines. Everything needs to be working towards that. Um, and then on the personal side, it is, you know, supporting, working towards, you know, supporting the long-term future and satisfaction and, uh, you know, whatever obligations I have when it comes to my family, right? right? Doing right by my family, raising my children, being the husband that my wife um, deserves. Mm. So those two parallel tracks would be, and those things work together, I think, but those are the two main purposes in my life. And then I have you know, virtues and principles of life that then, you know, give me the foundation to do those kinds of things. So those would be the things like trying to be grounded. Those are the things like continued self-development. That's a really important thing for me. Um, never losing your curiosity. I think that's mm -hmm. something that has been a guiding, um, I don't know if it sets a virtue or principle or what the heck that is, but that's, <laughs> that is a huge foundational part of me. Just, mm -hmm. uh, I am obsessed with learning and growing and, and, and exploring new things and, and reading and studying and, and being a student. I think maybe that's the way, being a student of, of everything that I explore. Uh, so that's something that then fuels those two main purposes. Um, I, I think, you know, just the basic, the very basic things like your family teaches you growing up, right? Integrity, being a man of your word being true to what you say you're going to do, um, treating others the way, I mean, very simple things, being, treating mm -hmm. others the way you want to be treated and, and, and simply living a good, um, positive life, being an example for others. I mean, you know, this isn't new to the, new to the world kind of concepts here, no, but I, I, I try to live in that kind of way while moving towards those, those two larger important purposes in my life. A lot of the things you're talking about here are very stoic in nature and yeah. that's a new sort of, I mean, everyone seems to be talking about stoicism since uh, I think Ryan Halliday has really popularized mm -hmm. it and others. Uh, yeah. My wife says, uh, you no, know, Mark, he, he displays all these stoic virtues. I'm like, what is that? Right. I don't, I don't know what this is. Right. And she's like, well, you're a stoic Travis. I'm like, I, I still don't know what this is. Right. Um, but I think you were actually named in by BHA. They, they had, uh, attributed that to you is that something that you actively seek out or is it something just has been labeled to you just by the way that you act uh well i think i have developed an interest in the stoics and stoic philosophy by you know folks like ryan holiday and tim ferris and so so i've read pretty extensively on those topics and i've just found so many parallels in so many um like that though that set of tools that Stoic philosophy provides so neatly dovetails with so many of the challenges that I faced as a hunter, as an outdoorsman, uh, or even as a, as a writer or anyone in business. Like it's, it's mm. simply like a tool set for dealing with life. And I found it to be a very useful tool set. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so that's, that's, you know, something I'm perfectly fine being, um, you know, in that conversation. Cause I think it's a useful set of ideas mm -hmm. and, a, and a pretty decent way to go through life. And it's, it's certainly helped me. You know, I don't have all the answers. I'm what 46, I think I am right now. I got to double check that one. Um, but one thing that I have found, if you want to be happy in life, it is that progressive realization of a worthy ideal as, um, Earl Nightingale would put it, but the, the fact that you're always learning and always sort of 
building. For me, I like to build things. I like the creation of something. Uh, not necessarily the ongoing upkeep of everything that I create and, and being in there, but if I've got something that I'm putting together and building and s- watching it grow, there is a natural byproduct of enjoyment and, and happiness that seems to come from that. And it seems like you have nailed that on the head with the constant learning, with the progression, something that you're working towards. Because if I've built something and it's doing well, I, I will become bored with it after a while if I don't have something new that I can learn. If it's not pushing me or challenging me or yeah. or building something that's going to... And when I'm young, you start out like, how can I how can I build myself? And then after a certain point, you're like, how can I build something that's going to make it better for others? Yeah. Yeah. 100% relate to that. Had, had those very same experiences. Um, I, I can't handle stagnation. Mm. Um, so, so yes, growth, exploring new things. Uh, I have to be doing, there's gotta be another project. There's gotta be the next thing to chase after, to explore, to, to, to work on, to, to pursue, um, to my wife's chagrin. I, I can't, <laughs> I can't just sit and be, yeah. you know, the, I, I, I have to have, you know, a cause, a purpose, a something that I'm, that I'm working on building, whatever it might be. Um, and then, yeah, like I, I, I definitely had a progression with my career where just like you described, you know, early on, it was just, you know, could I find a way, you know, I, I started my career in the tech industry, working Google, regular right? nine to five. Yes. There you go. Um, and right around that same time, I realized within weeks of starting that job, I realized like, oh, wow, this is not how I can spend the rest of my life. Um, but I'd started a website the summer prior about deer hunting. And I thought, you know what, I bet you, I bet you I could do something with that. And I decided like that fall, like I'm going to, I'm going to find a way to take my passion for deer hunting and, and make that a living somehow. I don't know how, mm-hmm. but I'm going to do it. And, and so for four years, I struggled to do that. I worked to build that thing on, you know, nights and weekends and all that kind of stuff. And so early on, it was just like, could I make this thing work? Could I somehow make a living doing this thing I love? And then, you know, I was able to do that. And then it was, okay, can I do this well? Can I, can I, you know, reach the top of this, I don't know, ladder that I'm, I'm climbing sure. up right now within that world. And then, right. okay, I was able to do that. Um, and then some, somewhere around, you know, eight, 10 years into doing that is when I start having these, you know, realizations where, um, it had to be about more than just me. And, mm-hmm. and I, I was so head over heels in love with, um, the, the, this world that I get to spend time in the, the natural world, mm-hmm. wild animals, wild places, wilderness. I, I mean, I'm I, head over heels is really the only way I can describe it. Um, I, and I wanted so badly, so desperately to keep these places around, um, that I just, I knew, you know, that that's what I need to be doing. That's, that's the only way I could feel I could use my talents or skills or sweat equity for something worthwhile. Like that was the place. Like there's, you know, all sorts of different people are built differently. They've got different skill sets. They've got different things they could do in the world. Um, mm-hmm. I can't solve world poverty. I can't cure cancer. Um, but I, but I know like this is where I'm supposed to do my thing. And, um, and so that was, I don't know, five, five, six years ago, something like that. When I kind of realized that this was the path that I need to pursue, it's not mm. trying to be the best deer hunter in the world. It's not trying to be the most famous, you know, TV show host in the world. It's none of those things. Um, it, it has to be focused on that greater good that I could work on. And so that's been guiding my decisions since that point. Um, and that's where I'm continuously, even now trying to figure out, am I doing that well enough? What do I need to be doing differently? Um, how do I, how do I matter? How do I make a difference? Do you have that conversation with your, with yourself often? Relatively. Yeah. I mean, I really do. Um, especially each year, you know, come new years, that's a great time to reflect. Mm -hmm. So we're just coming off of that this year. And I, you know, sat and spent a lot of time thinking about, all right, have your actions, you know, have the choices you've made in your career or with the content you're producing or with the projects you're pursuing. Are you, are you working enough towards that goal? Are you doing enough or do we need to start tweaking things? Do we need to change some things? Do we need to reconsider some things? Do we need to tackle new projects? Um, but yeah, I think that is something I think about fairly often. Um, especially if you, and gosh, I can, I I gotta be careful not to get preachy, but, um, (laughs) 
Preach. But if <laughs> if you pay if you pay attention to anything when it comes to the environment or public lands or conservation, anything like that, if you pay attention to what's going on in the world around us, it's really easy or it's really hard not to see areas of of danger, areas of worry, areas for concern, threats from every different angle to our public lands, to our clean waters, to so many different things. We can sure, go. There's a, sure. a million different angles you can go there, right? There's so many different things that threaten the future of these these places and these animals and these opportunities that that mean a lot to me and I think to a lot of other people. So, so I, I'm constantly reminded because of that. So I'll I'll constantly get this. I'll be reading something in the morning, drinking my coffee, and I'm like, oh my gosh, this place has got this this thing happening to it, and 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 I can't imagine a future in which we don't have this whatever it is yeah and you can you can find yourself get depressed pretty quickly if you let that um that consumes if you, you let this yeah consumes you and i'm constantly reminded of something that um yvonne chenard says has said which is the the greatest cure for depression is action i I'm constantly whenever i find myself reading an article or seeing some new study about you know how this wildlife population is going down the tube or how this animal mm. is just about to go extinct or this new mining project is going to you know devastate the headwaters of a salmon run or something right I, I i just constantly remind myself well the only way to deal with this you know negative feeling right now is, is action so what can you what can you do do you and find do you find you battle addressed. with that that negativity is that something that manifests itself you a little seem like bit a like a thinker yeah i'm a thinker um and so i have the you know i can i can dwell on things sure um i'm i'm generally a positive, happy person. So I don't have like depression issues. I don't right. have that, but I do have the ability to sometimes just be like really bummed out about stuff and, mm -hmm. and maybe upset about things. And so then the question is just, what do you do with that feeling? What do you do with this? Do you just read this stuff? Do I just become like this guy who reads about everything that's wrong with the environment, everything that's wrong with wildlife reads. And no, I know everything there is to be said about the million threats to our wild places and environment and right. waters. But what good is that unless you act on it? And so that's what I constantly try to remind myself of is, is it's no good to just dwell in bad news unless mm -hmm. you're going to take that information and do something about it. So when I was young, I was diagnosed with ADHD. And there are people who get energy from being around other people. Call them extroverts, right? And in a large group and they're just more and more energized. I've always found myself under that definition, to be more of an introvert when I am around other people. I enjoy it, but at the end of the day, I'm feeling drained. Like if I have to go to SHOT Show in Vegas or one of these, man, by day one and a half, I'm done. Right? Yeah. Um, but I found just being in nature is something that creates a bit of a, maybe forces me into a meditative state, allows me to be recentered and... I think there's huge value to everyone having a better connection with their natural environment. I'm curious what it is for you where you say you absolutely love it. Like you just love it. Is it something that you need that fuels you in a similar way that I need to get out into the wild? Yeah, 100%. Um, it's, it's, it, it, it does all of those things and, and all of my, um, my greatest memories, my greatest, most powerful experiences, the things that, you know, outside of my family, the only thing that, you know, would get me up in the morning incredibly jazz, the only thing that I'm incredibly excited about doing, the thing that um, does refuel me, that recenters me, that gives me excitement and, and momentum moving into the future. I mean, all of those things revolve around uh, the outside world and, mm. and those things you can do out there. And, and that's been the case since I was a little kid. Um, you know, the, the things I loved as a child were animals, right? I mean, that's a pretty natural thing sure. um, for a lot of kids, right? We have an innate connection to nature. They call it biophilia is this theory, um, that we were, you know, because we evolved surrounded by these other life forms, uh, we are predispositioned as humans to have an innate connection to them. Ah. And some of us stray from that. Some of us eventually become divorced from that through, you know, you know, choices to live farther apart from nature, but it is an inherent human thing to, to feel what you feel when you go outside, 
and for me to feel those same things. And I think oftentimes you get someone who's lived in the city and, and been an office worker and, and never had that opportunity to get outside and see these places, do these things, have up close experiences with wild animals. If they never had that opportunity, but mm-hmm. then they're, in, they're invited to go on a trip and they go to a national park and they see a Buffalo up close and they come around a corner and there's a grizzly bear standing in the river and they spend three nights out there and see the stars at night and, and hear the wind whistling through the trees and all those things. They all of a sudden realize like, something has been tapped they've tapped into something that was there all along that was lying latent deep down inside their chest that now they're all of a sudden experiencing and realizing that a part of them all of a sudden is being able to 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 live Mm -hmm. that never did before um and i think that's what i was just very fortunate to encounter and experience at two three four years old and never left it and i've just continued to try to experience that as much as I possibly can ever since. You know, a lot of people tell me that it's fear that prevents them from wanting to go out and explore wild places, whether that's fear in the ocean of sharks, even if they're in an area where there are no sharks or fear of the unknown is usually what it is. Fear of bears. I hear that one a lot. Yeah. Um, I understand you used to take Tylenol PM in order to get through the (laughs) night in bear country. Yeah. Do you you still do that? No, I don't. Um, (laughs) But yeah, the first, uh, when I started backpacking in grizzly country Mm -hmm. is when, uh, when I started taking that because yeah, I I grew up as I alluded, like doing outdoorsy things in Michigan. Mm -hmm. Um, and Michigan's kind of like a, I love Michigan. We have some great outside opportunities, but it's a slightly domesticated version of the wild world, Mm -hmm. right? We're not in British Columbia. There's not grizzlies around every corner, mountain lions and wolves <laughs> and really wild, wild stuff. Mm. Um, so I had I had a great beginner's um, – it was like a beginner's guide to the outside world. It's mm. my, my outdoor experiences at that point. And it wasn't until after college that I set off and started going west and having some of these different experiences. And so I started backpacking and started going into really wild places, really off the beaten path. And so at that point, yeah, that's when I – you know had those first encounters with with critters that could eat you for dinner if they really wanted to um so for that first couple of years really you know going to sleep i mean it's you know being in grizzly country when you're not at the top of the food chain it's different it and, is isn't uh, it it is different and so early on especially when you don't know much about it and it's mm-hmm. so brand new um i was even you know skittish around black bears early on mm-hmm. um but you know with time and experience and exposure you start to understand how to operate in those types of places, not uh, living in a world of fear, mm-hmm. but I think w- with respect, I think, I think that's how I approach bear country or grizzly country or really any kind of risk in the natural world is not fear focused, mm. but uh, with a, with a healthy level of respect for the real risk, the realistic risks, understanding it, preparing for it, operating within, um, you know, operating within a knowledgeable sense of, okay, how do we, how do we deal with this? How do we do this stuff in the right safe way? Um, so yeah, it's funny, you know, like my dad yeah. has never spent like that kind of time in grizzly country and doing these kinds of things. So it's just different. Right. Yeah. And so now we go up to Northern Michigan and like, he wants to go for a walk in the woods and he wants to carry his pistol. And I'm like, there's like a couple black bears somewhere around here, but there's nothing that's going to, you know, <laughs> nothing to bother, worry about at all. Yeah. But you know, he just hasn't had the exposure and time in these places where there are some things that are a little bit more uh, dicey. Yeah. So it's just what you're used to. It's what you're used to. It's where you spend time. It's what you develop a comfort level with. Um, and, man, there's certainly still things that scare me out there. Um, but um, yeah, Late at night, you hear a bump. Buffalo's rubbing up against your tent in the middle of the night. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I think that it's happened to you and your there. wife. There you go. Yes, yes. it did. Um, so, so, yeah, I think um, – the wild world is such a great place to confront that kind of stuff though. Mm. I mean, I don't think there's, I don't think there's any better way to learn to deal with discomfort or fear than putting yourself out there against the original elements and other critters that, you know, again, back to that thing I mentioned a second ago, like those were the, like that was the iron that we sharpened ourselves against to become humans, right? We Mm -hmm. evolved, we became what we are now by going out into the wild and surviving, finding food, finding shelter, dealing with the elements, dealing with other wildlife out there. Like that's what made us who we are. So Mm -hmm. what better way to 
you know, continue to confront what it means to be a human than to go back into that original, you know, landscape that we started. I find it really interesting as we evolve as humans, how disconnected we started to become from our food and from the process and from our natural environment to where we are. I, I feel like the pendulum is swinging back when people are talking about the 20 mile diet or 50 mile, though, if we don't even know what the proximity is, but uh, locally harvested or foraged, foraged food, um, getting back into basic virtues that our, uh, our forefathers would talk about and stoicism being one of them. I find it, I find it rather interesting that it swung so far and everyone, a lot of people would look at that and say, oh man, you know, the future's looking terrible, but nature's got an interesting way of course correcting. And yeah, I, I, I just, I think it's when you talk about people good at getting out to nature and connecting with those primal fears, I see like through COVID people were afraid. They didn't know what was going on. They watch the media, they listen to the news. They, um, they figure the world's falling apart. Everything's getting yeah. shut down. And there was a huge up, uptick in people wanting to get hunting license. I found wanting to yeah. get outdoors because they're getting all cooped up. Um, do you, do you see that pendulum shifting or was that, do you think was a momentary kind of blip because of COVID and, it's going to start going back to where it was. I mean, I think there's there's two things. I think one, it was definitely like a unique set of circumstances that kind of disproportionately encouraged getting back outside, right? Mm-hmm. Because there was all these inside activities that people just couldn't do anymore for, for some months. Mm-hmm. And so it, it pushed some number of people, millions of people, turns out, as far as the numbers tell us, to go and try this stuff again or try it for the first time. They maybe they saw hunting on TV or they heard about a friend who did it. And this was finally that time. Well, I got nothing else. I can't, I can't go to the movies. Can't go to the mall. Um, let's try it finally. Mm-hmm. Or let's try kayaking or let's try hiking. So there definitely was that COVID wave. And um, I think what we've seen, what, what the numbers seem to tell us now is that a certain percentage of that, I'm not exactly sure what that you know percentage might average out to be across you know different activities, but a certain percentage of have stuck with it. A lot mm-hmm. of them have gone back to their, you know, whatever they're doing prior, but a lot of folks have stuck with it. So I think we had like a, a special blip in the radar that bumped it up. But then I do think like there is just, there's always going to be some portion of the population out there that recognizes that inner longing that I talked about. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so I think maybe... 20 years ago, there might not have been as many opportunities for people to follow that. Mm. And by that, I mean, like there might, you know, with the technology we have today and the media we have today, there's, there's an opportunity to be exposed to a lot of new things that you maybe wouldn't have and to learn about them and to go really deep into that process. Um, unless you had like a mentor or family member who was into it. Mm-hmm. So I think there's a little bit of a unique opportunity now to capture that maybe 20% or whatever the number is of people who, who feel that inside mm-hmm. of them. Like, man, I, I kind of feel like I, when I watch planet earth, I feel something there, Right. but my family doesn't go to national parks. My family doesn't hunt. My family doesn't fish. We, we live in Chicago or whatever. And I feel very far removed from that. Those people 20 years ago, maybe never would have been able to, you know, explore that anymore. Um, but now we do have so many opportunities for people to, you know, go down that wormhole, you know, of YouTube videos or Instagram accounts or podcasts or whatever it might be, and at least explore it a little bit. You know, it's, there's still a a tough gap to bridge to get people actually out there still. Um, but I think we're seeing that resurgence of interest in these kinds of things. And we finally have, um, you know, the media to, 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 to fulfill that desire, at least that curiosity that people have. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think that's something we're, we're seeing. Um, there's always going to be this, this backlash to like the onward quote unquote progress and, uh, you know, um, of folks moving farther and farther away from nature. Like that's, that's where things are going, but I think there's going to be some percentage of people that are going to say, Hey, what we're leaving behind here really, really matters. And so it'll be interesting to see, you know, where the, 
you know, where the numbers and the demographics continue to go. But cer- certainly seems like outdoor pursuits, um, whether it be hunting and fishing or just more non-consumptive things like biking, mm-hmm. backpacking, camping, all that kind of stuff, you know, there continues to be increased interest there. And, um, you know, generally I think that's a good thing. So your podcast, and because you brought up different modes of media, whether it be social media or TV shows, podcasting, your podcast is very popular. It ranks quite well on an ongoing basis when you look at Chartable or these different different places. How did you find that podcasting and getting your voice out there changed the direction of where you're going or amplified the direction? Yeah, um, it was surprising surprising um a little bit in that i it ended up being more impactful than i realized it would be Mm. um i i I was fortunate that i was relatively early to the podcast wave um you know i started the podcast you know i started working on it in 2013 and launched it in the spring of 14 Mm. um so you know it was just before it really um spiked up you know i was like one of the only deer hunting podcasts out there at the time Mm. And, um, you know, I came to that simply because I was, I was writing about this stuff. I was doing videos about this stuff. Um, and I, I saw a natural hole in the market. Basically I was a podcast consumer already, mostly, you know, about business and marketing and different things like that. Um, uh, and I saw, oh man, these, these people are producing something that's really, really useful. Mm-hmm. And I don't see, I, I can't get this kind of information, at least at the level that I wanted it in this space that I was creating stuff on and consuming stuff with it. Mm -hmm. And so I saw an opportunity there and I knew that was a, it would be a natural way to continue teaching and and talking about the stuff that I was doing at the time. And so, and so, yes, I started it and it was a a wave of, of growth and a different level of connection with my audience that I didn't quite expect. Um, So yeah, it grew like gangbusters and really it allowed me to connect with my audience in a different way. And I think a lot of podcasters and even consumers of podcasters have now recognized that that's, it's, it's a different format than, you know, reading an article or watching a YouTube video or whatever. It's, it's in many ways feels like you're sitting down and having a conversation with someone Mm -hmm. right there in your earbuds. And, you know, sometimes it's for weeks and weeks on end, months on end. So I, I developed a, a somewhat one-sided intimate relationship <laughs> with tens of thousands of people. Right. Um, and that, you know, that was a lot different than what I was doing when I was just writing a daily blog. Well, some of the attributes of someone who's living a stoic lifestyle would be having grit, not complaining, being able to push through in difficult times. A side effect to that I would think is if people don't see your difficulties or your struggles and they, geez, there's nothing you're complaining about. You must have had it all served to you on a silver platter. Man, it must be easy for Mark to get where he is. It was the right time, right place. He's lucky, right background, whatever it might be. What are some of the difficulties that you had to overcome in order to be where you are now? Yeah, it's it's a great point. Um, and there's there's kind of two sides of it. Like I, I would say that the when it comes to the activity that I talk about the most on my podcast, for example, which is hunting, mm-hmm. um, I actually found that by sharing the nitty gritty failures along the way that happened to me all the time, I failed all the time. Um, that's actually what resonated the most with my audience and that stood out compared to a lot of the other stuff because mm. there, there's a lot of, heroes out there who do it all right and who are amazing what they do. I kind of talked about this earlier. Um, and that, that wasn't me. Mm-hmm. I was this guy who, who loved it, but was still figuring it out. And, and so by, you know, I could either try to cover up all the mistakes I was making and all the failures I was making, or I could embrace them and, and share them. So I struggled with all sorts of things when it comes to, you know, the hunting side of, of what I do, right. I, I've made every mistake you can make. I've, screwed up. I've, I've approached things the wrong way. I've done it all. Sure. And, and I, I decided at times I, at times I did not talk about it because I was so embarrassed or so upset. Right. Um, but the times when I did talk about it, I would get 
so much feedback from people appreciating that I talked about this and how it helped them, you know, deal with a similar thing they dealt with or, or gave them something to think about as they worked on their own journey. Um, so I've, I've now gotten to the point where I've realized like I can do the most good by sharing my bad That's because, a good point. um, we, you know, we all, um, we are all human, right? Yeah, totally. And I think, I think that we can learn most from our most human moments. That's what I've kind of found with, with my platform. So I try to share all that now in a way that, you know, we can make some kind of positive out of these mistakes. Um, so that's a long winded way of saying my hunting failures are well documented. Um, sure. and, and I'm criticized for it sometimes because how does he, how did he possibly screw up again? This guy sucks. I hear that. <laughs> um, still goes. Um, but on the flip side, I think there are some people who might look at, you know, where I am today with my platform or the, the work I produce in my career and, and say some of those things you said, right. um, you know, ab about, ah, this guy had it on a silver platter. Why is this guy up there? Who, you know, whatever it might be, this guy overnight success, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Um, and I have been absolutely fortunate. I mean, there's, there's definitely things like I have had privileged opportunities. I've had some lucky breaks. I've had all those things. Um, but I think the thing that probably is, um, the standout in my mind, I guess, is not that, um, there was any one right thing that I did or that there was any horrible catastrophe that I somehow overcame. It was rather, um, you know, a million tiny incremental steps that have slowly accrued over many, many, many years. Um, I, you know, for four years, I worked, you know, a you know, 60, 70 hour day job, whatever it was at Google while building wired to hunt behind the scenes all night, you know, staying up till three in the morning, waking up at four or whatever it was to get in any kind of time I could every single day, grinding away at that thing, never making a dime. Mm. Um, I get lots and lots of messages from people saying, how do you do what you do? I want to make a thing like this. I want a podcast. I want to be a YouTuber. I want whatever. I want to write a book. Mm -hmm. And they're like, I've been working on it for two weeks. Or I've been doing it for the last six months and it's not coming together yet. And whatever it might be. Um, and I think it's really important to, to remember that in most cases there aren't overnight successes. Usually it's, it's a lot of grinding away, slogging away, trying to get a little bit better today and a little bit better tomorrow and do a little bit more. And that's been my story. It hasn't been that I've had, you know, some horrible thing that I had to work through. It was just simply sticking through the, the many, 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 many years of, um, you know, not feeling like I was going anywhere with it or not feeling like I was making a difference or not feeling like anyone listened, was listening to what I had to say, but you know, just believing in that purpose enough that I would just keep doing it, keep doing it and trying to keep getting, keep getting better. Um, and, and that I think has been my story for the last 15 years or, or so that I've been doing that. Um, so essentially it's been, yeah, essentially what you're saying is you're an overnight success. It only took 15 years. Yes, exactly. Right? <laughs> it's uh, exactly a friend of mine. He would make millions. He'd lose millions, make millions. He'd lose millions, new endeavor, doing something one place and then sell it. And he's doing good. Easy come, easy go. And at one point he looked at me and I'm like, I'm plugging away at my business and I have no business background. I'm school of hard knocks, lucky to have gotten through school as it is. And I'm looking at him. I'm like, wow, man, you're, you're doing really good. Like when he's on his upswings and he's like, Trav, don't do what I do. Keep doing what you're doing. The people who I know who are most successful in life with their businesses are the ones who will plug through and continue to work when the times are tough, when there's no money coming in, when uh, everyone is against them and they just keep plugging forward. And I've always had a, uh, that in the back of my head as something. And I've, and I found that to be true as I continue, I'm going to make not necessarily mistakes. Even as you go through life, you can take different branches. I once looked, but another person pointed it out and says, well, maybe that's just part of your path as you go through life and those branches, as you call it which didn't turn out to the be the success that you thought they would be are the learning experience that you needed in order to get to where you are. So yeah. you, your success story as you're going through 
And I guess it comes down to what a person defines as success for themselves. Um, but from an outward exper- uh, external appearance of success from maybe a traditional uh, standpoint has been that of plugging away on an ongoing basis. I find that, I find that really interesting. And I, and I guess I would lead to a question as well, and you're about to say something. What is success to you? Yeah, so it, it's been a changing definition for me, right? right. So, so early on, success was um, trying to make a living doing this thing I love. Mm. And then it was trying to, like, establish myself as a credible um, – like, you know, it was just tr- trying to stake out my place within that community. So mm. first I was able to make it work and then it was okay. Now I wanted to be a credible, you know, I, I remember I do, I do, I'm this, I'm this cheesy kind of guy who does like five-year goals, right? It's not cheesy. So it's I, good. You need a goal. <laughs> you need a yeah. destination. So I ran across an old notebook of mine from like 10 years ago where I had my five-year plans, like what I, where I wanted to be from a business perspective, where I want to be from a personal perspective, from a financial perspective, all that Mm. kind of stuff. Uh, And so one of them was like, I wanted to be, I can't remember the exact wording, but something like one of the most respected and, um, you know, impactful personalities within the deer hunting world or something like Mm -hmm. that. Um, So it was stuff like that. Like I wanted to have staked out a place at the top of this deer hunting community at the time. Mm. Um, It was those kinds of things. And success now has shifted. You know, we, we talked about this a little bit, but success now is working towards that larger purpose, mm-hmm. which is I want to make a serious, long-term, positive impact on the future of wildlife and wild places. Like that's that's success now. Um, you could uh, – I don't care anymore about if I'm some big, fancy, successful, well-liked hunter or something. Mm. Um that that has lost its shine for me, and now I, I just want to make sure that my kids and their kids have wildlife to see and experience and hunt or fish. I want to make sure there's still wild places you can go and get lost in. I want to make sure there's clean rivers that still have fish in them. Um, that's 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 it now. Well, how old are your kids now? I my boys just both had birthdays over the past week. Okay, so I now I now have a five year old and a three year old. Holy crow! Yeah, and are they coming out on any of your adventures yet? Yeah, a lot. Good. They're uh, it's it's a lot of fun. It's it's changing the game for me. That's that's for sure. But uh, they both love the outdoor life, and you know we're fortunate to be able to spend a lot of time out there and just take them you know with with us for as as much as i possibly can so we spend a lot of time camping and hiking and we've got a boat we float down a lot of rivers and (laughs) throw a lot of rocks catch a lot of frogs catch minnows um i take the boys i've taken the boys on some hunting trips now with me a lot of fishing um so so yes as much as i possibly can they are they are out there and seem to be loving it i was asked to put a few years ago i was asked to put together a video of sighting in a rifle and it's up there on youtube and trying my hand at doing some video work and I brought a fishing rod with me because I was down by an area where I knew there'd likely be some fish and so when I wasn't filming I was out there catching some fish and carbon fiber rod and I lifted on up and there's the area that I was doing it in had these power lines going overhead and then my first indicator should have been when I'm pressing like record on the camera it was making a kind of a snapping sound and I'm getting this feedback coming through the ears as I'm listening to Uh-oh. the audio. Anyways, I'm lifting up the, th- the fishing rod and my rod starts bzzz, vibrating in my hand as I do it each time. And I'm like, I think I'm going to cast a little bit lower here, right? Uh-huh. <laughs> but it brings to mind, you've been struck by lightning, haven't you? Well, I, I don't want to say go so far as to say I was struck by lightning, but okay. I felt like, uh, I can't even remember what it was called. It's... um. It's like the beginning shock of a lightning bolt. Okay. So I was, I was, I was walk, I was fishing. I was walking to a river, and I had, I was holding my fishing rod up upright, and there was a storm coming in, and I was, you know, pushing my luck and wanting to try to fish before the storm got really gnarly, and I was, I, I felt like this vibrating feeling mm. in my arm and me. Yeah. And at first, I didn't realize what it was, and I, I just 
like put my hand down and turned around, was like looking around, and looked up, and I'm like thinking, <laughs> not realizing. And, and when I did that, it stopped. And I was kind of looking around, I'm like that is what is that? Am I just noticing this weird thing? And then I kept walking, put the rod back over my shoulder, kept walking, and then it happened again. And that's when I realized, oh, this is electricity coming down wow. through the sky into my fishing pole. So I didn't have like a, I didn't have a real bolt. Okay. Me. Just, okay. Um, just that. There's a word for it. I can't the remember what it is right now. Something like that. It's the beginning of those electrons starting to connect with you. And uh, so I was very lucky that it didn't become anything worse. No kidding. What was your uh, – do? You, I think you've documented a few of these things. Do you, do you have big plans for next hunting season coming up? Are you able to talk about any big plans that you have? Yeah. I, I mean, um, I wouldn't call them – I mean, I don't know what's called big plans. But, um, but yeah, I'm filming, uh, filming a series of six different hunts this coming season across the country. Um, some of those locations are TBD. Uh, but these will be kind of like short films for the Meat Eater YouTube channel. Um, every place from stuff locally here to Michigan to hopefully maybe Montana, some western states. Um, a little bit of the Great Plains in there too. Um, documenting kind of a, a wide array of hunting opportunities and some conservation stories within those. Mm. Um, so that's that's on the hunting side. And then... Um, you know, hopefully starting to work on some, some bigger writing projects again, tackling some of these things we've talked about really? that I'm excited about. Um, and so that's that's kind of the big stuff staring me in the high, hairy eyeball right now. <laughs> I, I did a podcast with a fellow. He's a uh, four-time best-selling author, uh, nine books he's written, and he was working on his 10th book, and he says, I'm not going to finish writing this book. Now that AI is out here and they've commoditized uh, uh, text and all, all the rest, so he's making mm -hmm. he's going to put together a documentary, I guess, speaking about what he's his plans there. But I, I wonder how much um, uh, AI and and the, the the changing landscape of how people are consuming literature is going to impact the um, uh, future of book writing. I wonder. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, it's something I've uh, something I've wondered about a lot too, just especially with some of these more recent, um, you know, chatbots and stuff over the last three, four, or five months that are really pretty remarkable. Mm -hmm. um, it will be interesting to see how that changes things. I think it will commoditize, you know, your basic copywriting and things mm -hmm. like that. You know, basic elements of writing. I think it'll become a tool for larger writing projects. But I, I don't see AI, at least not in the short term, replacing um, the human experience. Mm. That's something that artificial intelligence can't yet have. Um, and so, at least for the next, for, for the foreseeable <laughs> future, I think I'll still have a job there if I continue living life and, you know, pursuing things of interest uh, and having something to say. I think. Uh, there isn't a Mark Kenyon robot yet that can tell it any realer than I can, at least. You know, it's funny. I actually typed into it. And I said, what questions would you ask Mark Kenyon? It comes out. I'm like, I don't like any of these things. And I don't think he would either. So I think we're safe for a little bit. Yes. We'll uh, enjoy, enjoy our paychecks and our, uh, our well-being for the moment, at least. Is there anything that we haven't covered that we should touch on? I don't know. I mean, I, I've enjoyed chatting about all this stuff, and and I just would encourage folks to, you know, if if you've got a an interest in the outdoor, in the outdoor life, keep keep pursuing it, keep chasing it, get outside. Uh, you know, all good things come to those outside. I'd say, if you're looking for something, you can usually find it out there, and um, it's it's always done me right. Well, I'm told that I'm supposed to put it bookend it, front end, back end. So if you or at this point, make sure to check out the Wired to Hunt podcast with Mark Kenyon. Uh, like, comment, subscribe. Uh, it helps a lot, gets the word out there. Uh, share it with your friends. Mark, thank you so much for being on the Silvercore podcast. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Travis. It was a lot of fun.